Good evening. Happy Friday. I've been catching up on all this Chili de Castro, Kate from Massol report shenanigans about what went on and how Chili looked up a bunch of case law that had no real application and tried to argue with the judge about this case law that had no real application. And Chili ended up losing, which <laughs> entirely unexpected, I assure you, because he is, of course, a constitutional scholar. He has the t-shirt to prove it. Anyway, I have never practiced law in Massachusetts. I am not licensed to practice law in Massachusetts, and so I can't speak to practicing law in Massachusetts, but I am an attorney in California, and I have practiced law in California, and believe this or not, I've done more than a fair few civil harassment restraining order cases, both on the petitioner side and on the respondent side. And one thing that I have never done is I have never researched a bunch of cases to try to argue case law in court. When you go to trial, when you go to trial, your goal at trial is to prove things. If you are the petitioner, you have the burden of proof in a civil harassment restraining order, at least in California. I'm going to assume it's also that way in Massachusetts. But if I'm wrong, well, talk to a Massachusetts attorney. But generally speaking, the petitioner or plaintiff, depends on how they style it, I guess, uh, would have the burden of proof. They're the ones going to the court and saying, this is what's happening and I need relief. Now in California, the burden of proof is on the petitioner and the standard of proof that they have to prove their case beyond is clear and convincing evidence. That's essentially the civil equivalent to beyond a reasonable doubt. It's the civil equi equivalent to the criminal standard of proof. So it's a, it's a fairly high standard. It's, it's a very hard thing for the petitioner plaintiff to make. Now, when the judge makes his ruling, the judge knows the law. You got to remember that the judge in a, in a courtroom that deals with civil harassment and restraining orders probably deals with 10, 20 civil harassment and restraining orders per day. Now, they may not have trials on all of them, and, and I, having sat through a lot of trials on them waiting to get to my turn, uh, most trials don't take more than an hour in for a civil harassment and restraining order. Usually there's only two witnesses, usually they're both pro per, and so they just basically each say their side of the story, and then the judge makes a decision. Now, That's the way it's supposed to work because the judge knows the law. He sits through a bunch of these. And even if he's a brand new judge, they have these handy little books called Judge's Bench Guides. And in the Judge's Bench Guide, basically it walks the judge step by step through the entire process of a civil harassment restraining order. Now they also have Judge's Bench Guides on just about every other thing that goes in front of a judge. But I have in my office a judge's bench guide for civil harassment restraining orders, for, uh, for emergency protective orders, for uh, domestic violence restraining orders. I have all sorts of judge's bench guides on restraining orders in my office from various years because as a first-year family law attorney, you want to know what people have done two, three years ago, maybe even four years ago. Anyway, my point is, my point is that when you get into court, you need to concentrate on developing the evidence that's going to prove the things that you need to prove to get your restraining order. Because at the end of the day, when the judge makes his decision, all of the evidence that he has to work with is the evidence that you have introduced in court. That's it. Well, technically, he could take judicial notice of some things, but those are going to be things like the locations of towns, you know, the, the fact that the earth is round, things like that. Uh, he can't take judicial notice of things kind of specific to your situation. So you have to, at trial, develop the evidence. That's where you win or lose. Now, an appeal is an entirely different matter because when you go to an appeal, you have to say that there was some error at the trial court level, you're no longer worried about developing evidence. You're saying that there was an error, there was a rule of law that was violated by the trial court in some sense. Uh, evidentiary rule, uh, constitutional 
uh, violation, something was suppressed that shouldn't have been suppressed or was, or was introduced that shouldn't have been introduced, that's what you have to prove at appeal. And so the appeal is going to be very law-based. You have to find all the statutes and, and constitutional references and, and uh, cases that have fact patterns that are somewhat analogous to your fact pattern and extrapolate from them the various rules that you think the trial court violated. So it's a different ball of wax, but, but I assume this is, the, this is the speculation part of this little video. I assume that Chile watched those uh, or listened to those Supreme Court oral arguments. That's what I assume. And I assume Chile wanted to be one of those attorneys that are arguing cases in front of the Supreme Court, which are very, very case law intensive. You have to know your specific facts, but those have already been developed. So really, you're just arguing the cases around a very narrow point. There's some specific, some one specific thing that you're really arguing around. And that's very case intensive. And so those, those attorneys who go and argue in front of the Supreme Court, they know all of the cases around that particular narrow subject of law by heart, like the back of their hand, and they will argue case law. But they're in front of the Supreme Court. They're not at the trial court level. So at the trial court level, just remember, you're there to establish the facts. Try to introduce the facts through testimony, through documents, through videos, whatever you have to establish the facts, because that's the important thing. The judge knows the law. He'll make a decision. If you disagree with the way he applies the law, then you're going to go to appeal and then you can argue the law. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.